Oh. Perfect. And then uh, Andres, take us away. Thanks for having me. Um, as I just told you, this is my first time giving a seminar at 9 p.m. Uh, local time, Oslo time. So I'm curious to see how that uh, is going to turn out. Um, so this is uh, joint work. We started this uh, as like a, uh, an Oslo team uh, with Inga and, and Juan and Kanalena. Um, Jan is now just moved to Genoa, and Inga is at the Statistics Norway, so we kind of dispersed a little bit. Um, and, uh, and this is something we've been working on for some time. Um, and the title is Trade From Space. So that does not mean trade in space or space trade or something. This is what we mean by this is that it's trade as, as measured from, uh, from space. Um, so, uh, so we're going to look at um, using satellite data to, to measure the movement of container ships, basically. So that's, um, that's the, the title. Um, OK, so um, some motivation. So I, um, <clears throat> I looked at this website yesterday, so CM, CMA, CGM, uh, to check how I could most quickly get a container from, uh, from Long Beach to Oslo. And this is what uh, this website gave me. Um, I can take like a first bus, which they call the California Bridge. And that's gonna depart from Long Beach on October 29. And it's gonna go through Southampton and then Le Havre in France and then Rotterdam. And then I have to, to switch to another bus. Uh, so that's the Oslo Breivik service, which will take me from, I have to wait there um, like five days. And then it will take me from Rotterdam to Oslo. Uh, so the whole trip is going to take me like 40, 40 days roughly. So, <clears throat> um, so this is this is how you know the container industry works. There are like lots of different buses around the globe, and they're kind of shipping stuff in. You know, they kind of typically going in circles as or in in a loop, as you see in in this picture. Um, so, um, and I don't think like as economies, we typically don't really take those routes much into, into account. Um, so which ports are like directly connected and, uh, and which ports are like indirectly connected. So where would you actually go if you want to go from LA to, to Oslo? Um, as, and for like trade economies, I guess we're interested in simply because you know, we want to have a, a good, good measure of, of trade costs and, and those indirect uh, links or, or these routes so clearly matter for, for the measurement of, of trade costs, at least for by sea. Um, and, and more generally, I guess we're interested in how, how like this network um, can uh, affect more aggregate outcomes. For example, if you have a shock to, to a segment in this, this network, it will have ripple effects, and those ripple effects are going to depend on how how the network looks like. Uh, and of course, um, uh, an example of this uh, a few months ago was this uh, giant uh, container ship that was stuck in the, the Suez Canal, uh, the the Ever Given, uh, and we you know read off and then use them on Twitter every day how this kind of had uh, had those ripple effects. Um, Containers are important. Uh, roughly 80% of merchandise trades uh, are shipped by sea uh, in terms of volume. Of course, in Val, it's, it's a lot le less than that. Um, most countries that are like have a, uh, have some kind of port have, have a container port. Uh, so you can think of those ports here as, as nodes in, in the container shipping network. Um, so what we're going to do, or our contributions, I think, are, are threefold. Um, I'm going to show you some, some facts about the global shipping network. Uh, we think most of this is, uh, well, there are, I'll mention the related literature, but most of this is, is relatively uh, novel, I think, uh, both in terms of documented uh, direct routes and also indirect uh, documenting. Or what we're going to do is construct an algorithm to, to, uh, to, to get at where these indirect routes are and how many stops you would need to uh, need to have in order to go from, from A to B. Um, and then we're gonna go after this ripple effect thing. Um, uh, and we're gonna do that not like with a very transitory shock such as the, the ship that was stuck in the Suez, but we're gonna look at the expansion of the, of the Panama Canal in 2016, which was more of a permanent uh, 
shock, not a negative shock, but a very positive shock to, to the trades, trade network. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we're going to look at what happens not to not to shipping from different points in the network, but to trade. So whether this affects global trade volumes. Um, and we're going to do this in two different ways. So first, we're going to do a simple diff and diff. So where we use this, this the, our knowledge about the network structure to identify which um, ports or port pairs are using the Panama, or we think they're likely to use the Panama Canal. Um, and then we can look at uh, trade between countries that are using the Panama Canal more or less intensively. So that's basically the, the idea. Um, yeah. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to go back to our models and we're going to have um, a, a relatively simple um, model with a trade model with endogenous routes. And we will try to, to quantify that, that model and, uh, and, um, and look at what happens to, to trade when we shock the model uh, using kind of the, the, the identification that we get from, from the reduced form. And we can look at things like you know, welfare, how this affects different countries, um, and so forth. OK, literature. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to talk much about this. I guess there are three strands here. So first is like using satellite data more, more generally. Um, then there's a literature on, on shipping and container shipping. Um, and there's also um, um, uh, a small literature on, on kind of shocks to, to, to the transportation network, for example, um, Jim Ferry's paper on the, on the Suez Canal a few years back. Um, I guess the closest thing to, to this paper is this recent paper by uh, Ganapati and al, where they also look at container shipping, but they analyze more the hub and spoke feature of this, of this network without you know, looking at uh, infrastructure shocks, uh, such as Panama, that, that weed. Okay, um, so I'll start with some data. Uh, and I'm going to show you some stylized facts that I think motivate how we what we do and, uh, and how we model this ultimately. Um, then I'm going to explain to you how we identify routes. Um, and basically, what we're going to do is to construct like a route planner um, um, for, for the container shipping uh, network. Um, then I'm going to move on to the canal expansion, um, the reduced form approach. Uh, and then the, the model and the more structural approach, and then conclude. OK, so let's move to the data. So this is so-called AIS data, um, automatic identification system. Uh, this is a technology to track the movements of ships. So a ship would typically have both um, a receiver and a transmitter, so a transceiver so that the ship can receive signals about the whereabouts of other ships so that you don't crash into one. Um, and of course, you will also identify, you will transmit the location of, of your ship so that other ships can do the same thing. Um, so, so clearly one objective here is to, uh, to improve safety um, uh, on sea, to be seen by other ships and to be seen. Uh, it also allows authorities to monitor vessel movements. Uh, you can think about, um, you know, uh, monitoring the fishing fishing uh, fleets uh, for security reasons and um, and so forth. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it, this gives us uh, more or less a global and comprehensive picture of the of the movement of of basically all ships. But our focus focus here will be on on container ships. Um, because this AIS uh, transceiver um, uh, has to be fitted to, to an international ship um, if it has a gross tonnage of 300 uh, tons or more, which is, uh, which is small and definitely a lot less than uh, uh, nearly all container ships. Um, so we see more ships than container ships, but we are going to drop all those other ships and focus on container ships. Yeah, so this is just like a snapshot of how the, the AIS, AIS data 
uh, would, would look like in a given uh, point in time. Now, uh, our data is not gonna look like exactly like this. So what we are gonna use is so-called port call data. So you can think of every port as having a geofence. So when you enter the geofence, there's like a ping and uh, the marine traffic, that's the company we bought this data from, uh, will know the identity of the ship when it arrived to the port um, uh, and the current draft of the boat. So how, how deep into the water the, the, the boat uh, sits. Um, now, the reason we, we have this data is simply a cost issue. We could get like the real-time data of, of everything, but uh, I'm not that rich. So we ended up buying the, the port call data and we have that for all ships in 2016. So basically it's a, like a um, high, high resolution data set for 2016. Uh, and let me remind you that the, the Panama Canal expansion was in the smack in the middle of, of 2016. So that gives us a, like a nice pre and post um, um, kind of setup for, for this data. We can merge the, the AIS data with the ship uh, information from the Clarkson World Fleet Register. So that will give us, for example, the capa capacity of the ship um, and the so-called scantling draft. So that's basically how far the, how deep into the water the ship would, would be if it's fully loaded. So then you can see that with the current draft and the scantling draft, you can basically calculate um, how, uh, how much cargo is in a given container ship. Uh, so we're gonna use that for some, for some things uh, later on. Um, yeah, um, we're gonna also use standard data. So uh, trade data, we're gonna have uh, quarterly contract data from 2013 to 19. And we're gonna, for like the model uh, quantification, we're gonna use some, some standard data on expenditure and, and stuff like that from uh, Eora. Okay, so let me move on to the facts. Um, I guess you already saw that on like, the first picture that these, these container ships typically operate on fixed routes. And you can see that clearly in this table. So what you have in the two first rows here is the, uh, the total number of ships that we have, so around four, 5,000 ships. Um, the median ship is passing 64 ports in a given year. So that's this number here. Uh, but the number of distinct ports is only 12, right? So it basically goes back to the same port like five times in a given year, right? Um, next, I want you to focus on, on rows, um, uh, or the third row. Um, Shipping is highly concentrated in space. So now we go to the kind of flip the data set to the port level. Um, so we have around 500 ports in our data sets. And the number of incoming ships um, for the median port is around 200. But the max is more than 14,000, right? So you have these mega ports. So that would be like, Shanghai and uh, um, Ningbo, I think, Shenzhen, these Chinese ports, which are like the biggest in the world. Uh, but the medium port is, is uh, much, much smaller. So these would be like the, the big nodes in, in this network. You also see this at the port pair level. So we have around 4,000 port pairs and the median port pair um, has um, uh, 30, uh, 38 chips, but the maximum has much more. Finally, uh, again, just focusing on this number that we have uh, uh, a little bit more than 4,000 active port pairs, uh, it's a relatively low number, right? Because we have five, more than 500 ports. So the potential number of port pairs uh, is 500 squares minus the diagonal, right? So, so not that many port pairs are actually uh, active, right? In fact, only 6% of all port pairs uh, uh, are, are active, right? So this, 
This tells you that this network is, is relatively sparse. There are not that many direct connections in the container shipping network. Um, so as a direct consequence, most of the trade is actually going through indirect links and you have to stop along the way, such as you did if you wanted to go from LA to, to, to Oslo. Okay. So um, now the challenge here is of course that we don't know um, where the cargo is going, right? We can see that a ship is fully loaded from, from LA to, to, to Rotterdam, but we, don't, we can't follow the cargo from Rotterdam, right? So we don't know whether the final destination is gonna be Oslo or not. So, so what we're gonna do here is basically um, to, to construct a route planner. So we're just gonna construct a simple algorithm that where the objective is to find the fastest way of getting from LA to Oslo. And we're gonna do that by using the observed schedule for the departures and arrivals um, by port. Um, and yes. yes. Is it possible to ask a question here? Go ahead. You know, which, you know, I know that the AIS, uh, the, all the ships do not uh, report. So which percentage of the containers that you are working with are really able to, to, or the total containers you are able to record or you are working with? Well, I think it's the uh, very close. Is incomplete data, right? I think it's very close to 100%. As, as I mentioned, uh, these, the, the ships that are bigger than a certain size have to have uh, an AIS transceiver uh, according to international regulations. So if they, if they don't have the transceiver, they're doing something illegal. And I don't think those big commercial container ships are, are like in the gray zone. Like certainly for smaller fishing vessels, pirates, all of that, it's certainly very different. But for container ships, I'm pretty confident that this gives us more or less everything. Yeah, it's, yeah, okay. So because uh, these boats uh, or these ships, they only report to IS voluntarily, right? It's not mandatory. There is a big report from the IMO indicating how many and the big models from uh, trying to really predict uh, the actual growth, you know, so, but anyway, so I, I was just wondering because I know that uh, the reporting is voluntary. It's not mandatory. No, so, uh, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, it is a requirement by, by international regulations to have the AIS transceiver on board for um, ships bigger than a certain size. If that always happens or not, of course, I, I don't know, but, but I'm, I would be very surprised if there's a lot of uh, yeah. missing, missing data for yeah. these kinds that, of shit. That's right. So that's what I was asking, what, what percentage of the containers you are studying of the total or the actual number of containers? Of course, those, those missing transceivers, I, I don't observe them. So I cannot say that with any precision, but, but I would be very surprised if we have missing data of more than a couple of percent. That's my guess. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question, Andres? Oh, yeah. Hi, it's, it's Dan Treffler. Um, Andres, um, I, just, uh, I think you'll be sympathetic to this question. Uh, this is a fixed network, right? And obviously networks are endogenous. Um, I mean, am I correct in thinking that when you come to calibrate, you'll still have an exogenous network? That's the pur purpose of identifying the roots. Uh, and if so, um, maybe you could say something a, a little bit about, like if I imagined alternative networks, say like uh, like Holmes was imagining why India can't ever break into the uh, the Walmart Walmart world because you know it's all sewn up by Shenzhen. But I could imagine a world in which Shenzhen and Bombay switch places. Could I? And my question is, could I imagine a world in which the distribution of ports is less skewed or more skewed? So is there anything you can tell us to help us think about multiple equilibria, what, what they might look like? So and I know you're sympathetic to this because this is what you do and you worry yeah. about these issues. So I, I think there are two answers to this, this question. So, so certainly when I'm using the, the root planner here uh, and to calculate these, these routes and, I'm, and then I'm gonna use that information 
in in our reduced form, uh, then certainly we're kind of taking the network as as as, as given. Um, um, now, in the model I'm going to show you, uh, then roots are are endogenous. Ports are not endogenous, but roots are endogenous. Oh. So mm -hmm. you will we we will see here reallocation. Um, um in in kind of in root space uh, uh later on in the talk okay excellent i'm looking forward to seeing that yeah i also, I also have a question um sure. i was wondering if you know anything about the cost of taking a given route i mean it could be that there's a route that is really fast but it's just very expensive um, so like the best the shipping companies are just charging a lot to take that that route yeah, that's um, an excellent question. So I actually have a slide on this, and so okay. I, I want to defer a, a couple of minutes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So and so that's a, that's a good um, good way to continue, right? So the root planner here is only focusing on on getting to a place the fastest. So that's that's the only objective of, of the root planner, and I'll come back to some of the limitations um, uh, from doing that. Um, and this is a so we just do this by by brute force and and uh, my my cotter used this uh, supercomputer here in Oslo to to, to make this uh, this happen. We might want to do this a little bit more efficiently, but now it's just kind of pure uh, brute force. Um, <clears throat> okay, what are the results from this? Well, um, you, you're going to get that most country pairs trade along routes involving two to three other countries. So that would be the the mode that you have two or three hops when you go from A to B. Um, and, and for the purposes of the pa Panama Canal, of course, the nice thing about this is that we can identify exactly which routes that is crossing the Panama and which routes are, are, are not. Uh, this is just an example of if you want to go from the US, if you want to export from the US, uh, how, this, how this network looks like. So you see clearly that you get some, some hubs. For example, to Northern Europe, um, you know, you have Britain and, uh, and the Netherlands over here. If you want to go to Africa, it seems that you have a hub in, in Spain and, or Portugal, perhaps. Um, Latin America down here, uh, Asia here, of course, with Hong Kong and Singapore and so forth. Um, also, this is a plot is a little bit messy, but let, let me just briefly explain what this is. So here we're plotting port pairs. So a given dot is a port pair. And the, the light blue colors are port pairs that have direct routes in the AIS data. And I'm plotting distance here against travel time. And of course, for the direct port pairs, uh, distance and travel time is more or less proportional, right? That's, that's more or less by, by construction because you don't have to take a lot of detours um, by sea. Right, but for the indirect routes, there's a lot of variation. Right, so you see this huge amount of variation for the the, the dark uh, blue dots, um, and it's not it's not obvious that here that the distance is a very good proxy for how how long it's going to take you to to use these indirect routes. Okay, um, so um, I guess as economists, we, we, you would think that well, it's it's really the cheapest or or some kind of combination of cheapest and fastest routes that, that really matters, right? So, so the way we think about this is that certainly a lot of the important cost factors, such as fuel, labor, and capital, is highly correlated with shipping time, right? So, so, so that's one reason, I think, to, to, to focus on time. Um, the other thing is that if we only care about whether uh, poor pairs are using the Panama Canal, the cost of not using the Panama Canal is so big. So even if uh, you know, uh, time is, is not the only factor, we have to miss by a lot to, to get the Panama Canal incorrect. Right? So, so what we did was to, well, instead of asking the route planner to find the fastest route, we asked the route planner to find the second fastest route, okay? And then we can check how much, how much uh, how much delay you would get if you if we kind of close down the Panama Canal, and the answer is that that would give us a delay of fourteen days on average, right? So two two weeks on average if you're not using the Panama Canal. 
So, so I think that's that's at least reassuring that you know other cost factors would be a be a secondary uh, concern. These those factors should would be very very high in order to eliminate uh, four in uh, two week delay. Andrea, yeah. is it the average among the shippings that are going through the Panama Canal, or is it? The average overall, so some of them are not affected, and the others have no, no, no. Bigger. This is the, the ones if you take the the poor pairs that are going through, and then you take and the you average take if, if you can't go through. Okay. Okay. Um, we also have done some other things. So, yeah, you had you um you did some back of the envelope calculation that I didn't quite follow right away when you said fourteen days would um the delay of fourteen days would be just more costly than. Um, taking a, a different route. What, what was that calculation? I mean, if I if I just said that these guys have like a fifteen percent interest rate, which is really high, that only raises their cost by one um, percent um, or less than one percent, actually. So, wh wh why are we, why were you saying like uh, cost couldn't you know a twelve day uh, fourteen day delay was something that people wouldn't be willing to absorb if, for cheaper costs? I, I agree. I was imprecise there, and I I think this is more <laughs> more more a gut feeling from my point of view. Okay. I think that the value of of those types of delays for the final customers must be pretty big. So that, I guess that was my my intuition here. But but I agree with you. It's uh, I, I don't have any you know solid <laughs> evidence to back this up. Okay. okay. Uh, but 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 at least you know the the fact is you're gonna get a fourteen day delay and you you can interpret that in the way you want but at okay. least to me that sounded like a big, big delay yeah okay yeah. can i ask a follow-up question which is did you allow for the land route as an alternative uh could you say that again if i did you allow for the land route as an alternative say you're oh. going from california to new york and instead of taking the container ship i'll just Use yeah, that's a good point. No, 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 no. This, this is only uh, this is only sea shipping. So yeah, for the U.S., then I guess that could be uh, that would be relevant. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Mm. Could could also have a question, Andres. I, Go ahead. I, I just have um. It's it's just a matter of like thinking about whether the direction of the road matters because mostly motivated by the recent news. You know, if you have a lot of unbalanced trade between two destinations, a big consideration of cost is like you know can i actually ship something back to kind of for me to return mm. it's it's all in the news these days you know because of the shortage you know the the fr freight rate is really expensive mostly because they can only do a single trip but not a, like a long trip yeah so yeah i've been wondering whether you have ever considered you know um that whether these kind of directional uh, so so the network here uh is directional and uh, the algorithm is calculating directional routes Right, so it could be a completely different route from from Shanghai to LA and LA to Shanghai, according to this algorithm. But again, it's only based on 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 time and uh, and, and and nothing else. So um, so clearly, um, I'm we're not taking into account whether the ship is say half full, for example, uh, when we do this this calculation. Got it. I guess you have some information of that, right? Because when you were merging that with the yeah. With the, with the uh, you could check possibly you know maybe 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 for for your data set you will be able to see you know whether they are fully loaded or or half only or or just empty. To, I, I agree. Uh, to give you like, a, yeah. but but it's not obvious how you would take that into account when for the route planner, right? Uh, e even if the even if you have uh, half empty ships going back to to China. Um, Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I, I guess at the end of the day, you still have to take a stand of like whether you would prefer it to be fast or cheap. It's still back to maybe George's question. Maybe it's a weighted average or something like that. But yeah. But yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, we've done a couple of more things to, to try to convince us that this makes sense. And I'm not going to go into the details, but what we have done is to just look at freight costs uh, using US customs data where you have this type of information. Um, and if you kind of regress that on on the um, on the travel time along the fastest route, you get very 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 strong relationships. And in fact, uh, other factors such as distance will turn completely insignificant. So it, it seems to uh, seems to make a lot of sense. Um, 
Uh, our co-author Yuan also used, um, got her hands on Chinese customs data. And then in Chinese customs data, you can actually see uh, one transit uh, country um, before it, the good arrives in the final destination. Uh, so then we can look whether there's an overlap between that transit country in the customs data and a transit uh, country in our fastest route calculation. And indeed, there's a big, big overlap there as well. So of course, this is not going to be perfect, but I think it's it's more or less the best we can do. We can certainly tweak this in a, in a few few different ways, but I think if we get it mostly right. Okay, so so given given our route planner, um, I'm going to turn the attention to to the pa Panama Canal. Um, so so to remind you again, the question here is is really okay. We get this this local shock to the global. Uh, shipping network. Uh, how this does this affect global trade? Um, we think that the Panama Canal expansion is a nice, uh, nice experiment. Um, it was really a bottleneck uh, before the expansion in 20, 2016. So in 2015, only 40 or 41 percent of container ships could actually pass the canal because it was turning turning out to be very outdated compared to modern modern con uh, container ships. The construction began in 2007. It opened 26th of June, 2016. And the capacity went up um, by 100%, so a doubling of the capacity. And the really new innovation was that they built a new lane. And the new lane could uh, fit these um, uh, post-Panamax or neo-Panamax uh, ships that you see in this picture here. So basically these ships are, are longer and wider and they can fit uh, more than twice as many container ships compared to the old Panamax. So the, the TU, so the number of containers uh, went up from, from 4,500 to 12,000 for the, the post Panamax ships. So that was really the big, uh, big, big change here. Um, okay, so, so the reduced form, um, methodology is going to be very simple. I'm just going to compare trade. So now I'm going to, to trade data, not AIS data. And I'm looking at the growth in trade between countries that are using the Panama Canal uh, and countries that are, are not using the Panama Canal. And I'm taking that, that information used the Panama Canal from the root planner, right? That's, that's where the root planner comes in. Um, <clears throat> The AIS data, of course, gives me this information at the port uh, pair uh, level, whereas trade data is at the country pair level. So we're going to aggregate um, uh, that information up to the to the country level, so or country pair level. So if a country, you know, say as the U.S. would have have a, a few ports that would use the Panama and other ports that would not use the Panama, we're kind of aggregating and taking like a weighted average uh, uh, of that, so that the Panama. Canal exposure would be a continuous variable for, for the US, for example, um, uh, but not for you know, trades between uh, Norway and, um, and um, uh, Ecuador, for example. Okay. Um, many country pairs do use the, the Panama Canal. So country pairs with some kind of exposure is around 14% of the total number, number of country pairs. In terms of trade, we're looking at 12%. And if we're looking at a country, country, not the country pair, we're getting that uh, more than 60% of countries have some kind of exposure to using the, the Panama Canal. Uh, so this is our simple diff and diff. Um, I'm going to regress log of exports between country I, I, J, J at time T on a pan, this pan exposure measure uh, in a post variable that turns uh, one in the third quarter of uh, 2016. And I can include a bunch of uh, kind of gravity type fixed effects here. So country pair level, uh, source uh, quarter, uh, destination quarter, um, and we can have some controls here as well um, um, that I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, so, so this is what it looks like. Um, the um, the post um, the post times pan exposure variable uh, is is significant around around ten percent. Um, it doesn't really change if you include controls or or not. That's going to be 
the post and we interact with say distance and uh, common language and other, other type of gravity variables. Um, and in general, it's, it's, it, it seems to be a very robust result and we're, it's very difficult to kind of, to break this. Um, um, in the third column, we also try to interact this variable with, with a number of hops um, uh, on, a given, on a given route. So I guess our hypothesis here was that if you have few hops, uh, then the Panama would kind of matter more because the, you know, the Panama would be a big part of, uh, or the distance, I guess, would not be, be that big if the number of hops is small. And there's some, some evidence of that as well, even though I guess the standard errors here are, are kind of uh, overlapping. Um, you can also look at, this is quarterly data, so you could do like a simple event study uh, before and after the, the, the third quarter of uh, 2016. So this is how it looks like. Uh, we start our data in 2013 and go all the way until the fourth quarter of 2019. Um, so for if you do this at the quarter level, you're rarely getting kind of coefficients posts um, or from the third quarter 2016 that are, are significant, a, a few of them are, but most of them would also you know, be, be uh, overlapping with, uh, with a zero here. Uh, but do, still, you clearly see that there seems to be like a shift from before uh, uh, to, to after. And most of these coefficients are, are kind of centered around, uh, around 10%. So 10% increase um, in trades um, after the Panama Canal uh, expansion. Andres, I have a question and a kind of suggestion. Here, the channel you're primarily thinking about is still the reduction of the shipping cost. Yeah. And um, I think Tom Holmes, he had a, a, a paper, possibly never circulated. The primary argument is about the Panama Canal enlargement is allowing more consolidation in terms of the containers. And you can explore kind of economy scale. So I'm not sure if you have any information. Can you also show maybe as like a mechanism kind of a validation exercise to, to also think about, can you actually have the fleet uh, size? In terms of, can, do you see actually larger fleets, or, or at least you can see, like for instance, like ex ante, you know, these kind of smaller fleet composition type of uh, uh, port pairs actually benefit more, or something like that. Like along those lines, would be really useful to share, like on the uh, detailed channel, um, so, on how 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 that reduces your uh, shipping costs, right? So, so, so certainly, I think what we do, we, what we do push here is that we think that the main mechanism is consolidation in terms of bigger ships, right? That there are some, that there are economies of scale in shipping and these bigger, bigger ships are reducing the unit cost of shipping. Um, and that I think we can provide pretty convincing evidence of. Now, I guess your argument is a little bit broader that is not only, I guess, ship size, but some, some other form of consolidation or? No, no, or... no, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm totally, we're on the same page. I'm just asking. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so this, this is coming. I'm, I'm, I think I will uh, provide, I will provide a lot of, of, of evidence of this. Andreas, um, yeah. just, just to fo follow up a little bit of a different question, which is, so, you know, the, the stuff that people did on the Suez Canal in the, in the 70s, like, could you put in perspective um, the magnitude of the changes here versus the Suez Canal. I mean, obviously, there are very different um, event studies in that this was fully anticipated, whereas the Suez Canal was a, was a, a shock that, that people didn't really anticipate. But it, and and obviously, one was you know enlarging, the other is is um, you know closure. But is there some some way of kind of comparing the magnitudes of the the trade response? Mm, and that's a good question. Um, Right now, off the bat, I, I don't think I can answer that, but um, I, I'll think about it. Thanks. Okay, so um, let me move on. Um, there are some threats to identification here. So I guess one thing that have already come up that is that roots are also endogenous and, and might change a lot over time. Um, now, what we can do with the AIS data is to calculate this Panama exposure variable um, potentially like in, in, every, in every month of, of 2016. And at least for, for the Panama Canal application, this seems to be very stable. So the Pan exposure variable 
does not change uh, much over time in, in 2016 that we have data for. Um, and as I mentioned, of course, uh, uh, Georgia was a little bit unhappy with this, but, but at least the way I think about this, this is that the, the opportunity cost of not using the Panama is, is very high. Um, yeah, we, we have also thought about like um, what, what the Panama Canal expansion did to kind of shipbuilding and ports overall. And I don't have time to go into a long discussion about this, but, but just let me remind you, as, as I started out with saying, that um, uh, only uh, around 40% of the total fleet could actually pass the Panama Canal before the expansion, right? So container ships were already very big uh, when the, the expanded canal came online. So in that sense, uh, we feel confident that that this, the Panama Canal expansion itself didn't really trigger like a major restructuring of the industry because ships were already very big. Andreas, um, just, yeah. just one quick point on that. I have a former student who's working on this. Uh -huh. You know, the US has these, and it's a big deal right now, these kind of uh, unions, you know, uh, ports are unionized. Well, there's an East Coast union and there's a West Coast union. You know, opening up that Panama Canal, put those two unions in competition which has an impact on port costs, which I guess is something that, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's not directly because of this, this uh, change in the, in, the, in, the, in the Panama Canal, it's just providing this competition, which then gives the port owners bargaining power against the unions. Um, mm. That's just one thing that I think that maybe is not quite captured by your setup. I, I agree. Um... Yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure what we can do about it, but uh, um, I, I fully agree with you that there are margins along those lines that also operate here that we, we don't take into account. I'm Jez. Yep. You see then that now you could you can't build a ship overnight, so I guess you should have seen some switching of bigger ships, certain routes getting smaller ships now because the big ships can be used on the Panama one, then that might be perhaps a more of a short run reaction. Yeah, and that's a great point. So now we, we, I, I'm gonna show you what happens to the ships, the ship size on the Panama Canal. But I guess, as you said, uh, uh, the, the flip side of that, at least in the short run, is that you should change smaller ships on other routes. And I haven't done that analysis, but, um, yeah, but I think that's a great suggestion. I'm going to look into that. Andreas, could I, yeah. I, I, I think I'm a little confused in a way that it feels like you don't need any of these points. You're saying threats to identification. Uh, you know, we often say that X causes Y not directly, but, you know, indirectly through ship size and, and other factors. That's not a threat to identification. That's just saying there's some sort of cumulative causation or whatever language you want to use. So I, I, really, I don't not, think I it's told, totally, you go haven't ahead. told me that there's a threat to identification. You just said I, that, that it, the causal link may be multi-level, multi-tiered. Yeah, I agree. So I, I think what I want to say here is simply that there are other mechanisms by which the Panama Canal could also change global trade somehow. And that's not going to be captured by, by using this kind of variation that I'm using here. That's the only thing I'm saying, okay? But I, I, I should probably change my language. Okay, um, yeah, we have done a ton, ton of robustness checks here. I, I don't have that much time, so I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, so let me instead uh, move on to the, to the model uh, in my remaining 15 minutes. So, and the model is gonna be very simple. I, I'm not gonna be building anything new here. What we're going to do is to use the framework uh, by, by Treb and, and Costas, uh, where they have um, an endogenous transportation network in typically in a country, and extend that to a setting of international uh, seaborne trade. So this is going to be a simple trade model instead uh, with no migration. So uh, labor mo mobility is going to be, be um, um, not going to be mobile. Um, then I'm, I'm going to use the satellite data to estimate the reduction in the cost of using the canal. 
uh, which will be uh, useful because then I can quantify the impact on trade costs, uh, trade, real income. And I'm gonna also try to compare the predictions from, from this kind of model to a so-called no network model where all the routes are fixed. Um, and I think that will give us a, a way of, of, of kind of thinking about what makes the network here special in terms of the predictions of, of, of the model. The, the quantification exercise is also useful because I can actually compare the reduced form stuff to, to what I'm getting uh, in, in counterfactual predictions in the model. So we can use that as also like a, a model validation exercise, uh, which, is, uh, which I think is neat. Okay, so um, we're gonna have N locations here. We can think of location as a porch. Uh, those could be I and J, or typically if we think about traffic, it's gonna be K and L. Um, L workers, CS, CS preferences, we're gonna have a continuum of varieties uh, new. And I can ship to J along several routes R at a cost, and those costs are gonna be multiplicative. So T here is the transportation cost between two segments along a given route. So you're just multiplying the Ts for all the segments in, in a given route. And as, um, as Treb and Casas did in their paper, we got just gonna have like these for shade draws that are no longer only for the varieties, but that also varies for each route um, for a given uh, port pair. So that's gonna give us like um, this random variation that makes this model uh, very easy to work with. So I guess one way of thinking about this is that if I wanna ship something from, from LA to Oslo, you know, the route planner might give us give me one, one option if, you know, I, if October uh, 16 is a, is a good date and another option if October uh, 18 is a good date, right? So that's why in this model, you're not gonna only see one route being chosen all the time could be several um, uh, routes that are used um, in equilibrium. Um, yeah, so um, this is gonna give me simple expressions for, for gravity. Uh, okay. These are- Sorry, Sorry to interrupt, can I ask just a brief question? Go ahead. So is this model consistent with the work that uh, Wen Huang and Sharat have done with on um, like entrepots, you know, where they like a lot of the trade a lot of trade goes through kind of like very few locations. Is this model kind of consistent with, with that? Like, does it allow for these like hubs and spokes and things like that? Yeah, definitely. So, so the, in, this, in this setup, um, routes are endogenous and routes will be formed where, uh, where it's the cheapest uh, um, way of, of shipping, right? So, so, so clearly there's, there's uh, there's going to be uh, uh, hubs formed here uh, endogenously. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to have a simple uh, expression for, for for trade, which is you know as we've seen a hundred times before. But there's also going to be an expression for traffic. So this xi here now is not trade flows; it's the amount, the the value of of cargo from a port K to a port L. Right? And that's going to be a function of the transportation cost on that given segment and the usual multilateral resistance uh, variables. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm so I'm a little confused. Maybe I just don't understand the, the model well enough. The, there should be some congestion cost. And I'm not, is that somehow hidden away in a Fresche model? I mean, maybe Sam knows it, but I don't see any congestion costs here. Uh, you, need, you mean congestion costs on a given uh, segment in a network? So Panama opens up. Now we can send more stuff to Long Beach. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not Long Beach, but to Miami. Um, that Miami can only take so much. Yeah. With its current court port capacity. So, so the simple way we model this is by the T's, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say that, well, the Panama expands, that's gonna lower the, the transportation cost on, on those but, segments that involve the if, Panama. But if everybody chooses that route, there'll be so much congestion that it'll become a high cost route. 
Yeah. And so, unless there's something in Frisch that I, I don't know about. Oh, well, isn't it, Andres, doesn't it really not take account of congestion? Wouldn't that be kind of the difference between this and the work of um, Pablo? Another paper that was looking at the highways in, uh, in Spain and Europe? Yeah, it seems like you're yeah. reinterpreting congestion as just cost, but it seems like it doesn't directly have a congestion idea. It just has a cost idea. Yeah, exactly. So th there's no endogenous congestion here, right? So the, the T's are not going to respond to more, more traffic along, uh, along a route, right? So, uh, so I, I guess another way of rephrasing is that while there might be congestion, but there's something just exogenously imposed by me. Right. So, so that, that's the way I model it. I, I agree with you that it could also be interesting to make this, this an outcome in the model, but that's not the way I've, I've done it right now. Okay, I, I should speed up a little bit. Um, okay, so the important thing is that you get a, like a gravity expression here for traffic and not trade, right? And this is gonna be useful for us um, uh, later on. Now, the equilibrium here, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but it's very simple to, to solve the equilibrium in this model, both in levels and in changes. So it's the two last equations here that allows me to do the exact hat algebra calculations um, and I think the, the only thing you need to know here is that these excise here are showing up, right? So I'm gonna use the initial uh, level of traffic in the container network um, from the AS data to parameterize this model, this model, right? The X, the trade here doesn't enter anywhere. It's only the excise, the traffic that enters when I, I um, kind of shock shock this model. Okay, um, so how do I estimate the reduction in the T? And uh, this comes back to the, to the mechanism and the way we think about uh, kind of scale economies of shipping here. So I'm gonna do a simple regression on a few different outcomes on um, and using the change from before the, or the, from, from before summer 2016 to after summer uh, 16, using the AS data, regress that on a Panama Canal dummy if, if uh, traffic is flowing through the Panama Canal. And I can include various fixed effects and controls. And the outcome is the, gonna be the change in ship size and the change in the number of ships and ship utilization. So that goes back to the draft measures that we can see how much cargo is actually on these ships. And then by construction, the volume of traffic uh, on a given segment is gonna just be the, the, um, uh, the product of average ship size, uh, frequency, so number of ships, and average utilization uh, on, on the segment. So I'm gonna show you three regressions where we have these, uh, these uh, outcome variables. So here you see the change in ship size, the change in frequency, and the change in utilization. And as you see, there's nothing going on in frequency and utilization, uh, but on ship size, uh, we typically see uh, 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 a significant response. So it depends a little bit on the specification, but between 10 to 20% increase in average ship size after the opening of the, of the expansion. Now, as we typically do in, in a lot of trade papers, you can parameterize the, the transportation cost as, as being a function of, of ship size, as the way I'm, I'm doing uh, over here. And then we can simply back out the change in the transportation cost on the Panama Canal segments. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, I could also show you this. This is just a simple picture of the number of ships passing or transiting the canal. This is from the Panama Canal Port Authority. And here you also clearly see this, this, the, the impact of, of these larger ships. So the Neo Panama Max ships, um, you start, they're zero before summer 2016 because they couldn't pass. And then you see it jumps up from July and afterwards. And the orange one here are all the other ships. So that's kind of slowly declining uh, after, after July uh, 
um, or June 20, 2016. So the, the big ships entered immediately. And you see already by December 2016, it seemed to kind of reach a pl plateau of a little bit less than 200 ships uh, transiting every month. So, so this is really coming back to the, I think the main mechanism here that we see these bigger ships um, being able to pass the canal. And this is driving down transportation costs on this particular segment. Okay, um, I have just a few more minutes. Um, let me just show you one counterfactual we do, which is like the, the I guess the most um, um, reasonable counterfactual to do, namely to take that reduction in the transportation cost that I just backed out and shock the model with, uh, with, that, uh, with that change. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna parameterize this model with trade flows at all. I'm only gonna use traffic flows from the AIS data. So that's the XI in, uh, in those equations that you saw uh, uh, a minute ago. We need some other things as well. We need to know something about the expenditure on all the different nodes in, in the network, uh, the trade elasticity, and we also need to kind of calibrate um, traffic volumes to traffic values. And I don't have time to go through that right now, but that's the, basically the, the alpha here. Um, now, um, remember the trade costs here. So the tau is endogenous, right? Because that, that depends on which route is chosen. Uh, so here you see what happens to the change in the trade costs when we shock the model with the Panama Canal expansion. So clearly for, and the, this is a density across port pairs. So clearly for many port pairs, this does, doesn't matter at all for trade costs. Uh, but then you get like this, this distribution of changes from, from zero to around minus two uh, percent in bilateral trade costs. And this translates into to changes in, in bilateral trade, of course. So this is the density of, uh, of the changes in, in trade from minus, and this um, one, two to, to around 20% increase in, in trade for um, across port pairs. Welfare changes. Um, this is uh, just picking the, the ports with the biggest increase in, uh, in real income according to, to this uh, quantification. Uh, so the big winners here are certainly uh, Panama itself. So these are the Eastern and Western ports of Panama. And then you see typically other Caribbean countries and, and Latin American countries uh, being the big biggest winners here. If you just calculate um, like the weighted average of all these real income ga gains across the world, uh, you're going to get something a little bit more than 100 billion US dollars. Um, um, whereas the Panama's cost, according to the Panama authorities, was around 5 billion US dollars. So at least. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you, you should probably take this with a grain of salt, but, but it seems at least to be the case that the, the gains here are, are widespread. And of course, not only accruing to Panama itself, but many countries uh, in the world. Uh, so the gains were shared, but the, the, but the costs were kind of borne by, by Panama. Uh, Andreas, may, yep. I, think, I think it might be more, uh, it would certainly be interesting to see a different picture, which is, real income change not as a percent but in dollars because you know if the united states gains you know a tiny fraction of its gdp that's still a big number mm. yeah i agree that's a good point i'll do that okay um i have a few other things to say but my, my time is up so i and i will uh as i promised i will respect uh my my time allocation uh, so let me let me just conclude. Um, yeah, I, I think we do get some new insights into the the container shipping network here. Um, as I, as you saw, there are few direct connections, so the sparseness of the network I think uh, could matter for for many things. Um, and uh, and I guess the final insight here is 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 about the Panama Canal itself. Um, and it seems to be uh, to pre be pretty widespread gains from from the infrastructure improvement uh, uh, and the network really uh, uh, you know does have a role here in in um, in um, in making those those gains uh, travel far far and wide. Okay, so I'll stop there. Okay, Andres.
Um, quick question. If I were the owner of the Panama Canal, I'd try to internalize all those gains by cranking up the price on the big ships. Did, did that happen much? Yeah, the pricing structure, we, we did uh, look into that. I, um, yeah, so I, 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 I should be able to answer this sure. better. So they, they did change the pricing. Uh, they, they did change not only the prices, but the, the way uh, they, um, what they charge or, um, you know, the, the, the whole different formula that was introduced when the new uh, expanded canal um, um, uh, opened. So um, what that effectively meant for the big ships, I, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, so that's definitely on my to-do list. I have uh, something a little bit related and sort of uh, related to what Dan was asking, which is, can you just look at the data and see whether the constraint was simply ship size or was it the flow? Because maybe, I mean, I think you're doing it more consistent with the same number of ships can go through and that wasn't really constrained anyway. It's just that the constraint was the size of any given ship. Um, but I, I thought you could kind of give a definitive answer on that based on your data, just seeing the, how the flow of ships change. And then the other, I, I remembered what the paper I was thinking of that really has more the congestion constraint is the one by Begelbaum and Schall, because that really builds in all these Lagrange multipliers and all this stuff. And I think that Costas and Treb's one is probably uh, kind of abstracts from that, maybe in a good way, but it would be kind of interesting to see whether the other approach would give you something different or capture something that about congestion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. I'm, I'm going to look into that. Now, now for your first comment, um, the flow of ships, like, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but but the, the way I, I, I presented the results here, basically the, the coefficients on those three regressions would give you the total, if you sum them, that would give you the total um, increase in, in traffic. And the other two coefficients were close to zero. Right, so the only the only margin that mattered was the was the size margin, which so you're saying that result you gave us would have already said it doesn't look like it was congestion in the number of ships, but it was the size effect pretty much only. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So okay. we also try to to look at like the port authority also provides data on waiting time. So typically the ships have to wait a little bit before they can transit. So we looked into whether the waiting time suddenly declined after the expansion, and that didn't seem to be the case either. But the, wait, yeah. the waiting time where in, at Panama or the waiting time at Miami? Oh, um, in Panama, yes. Of course, they could potentially wait other places as well. That's a good point. That's a little bit harder to, uh, to address, I guess. I guess the current problem is a lot about waiting time, like ships waiting in LA to unload. So that seems yeah. like Dan's congestion point. Yeah. Causing the problems right now. Yeah. So just, just following up on that, just um, I, I wonder whether by looking at all your data, you can sort of see how much more kind of ship usage we have, right? In, in some sense, like, you know, everything you talked about was this, this speeds up these trips. And now like these trips can be, these ships can now do maybe 10% more, more trips in a year. Um, is, is that what you see in the data in, in you know, the global? Oh, you're breaking up. Was that only me or? He's back. No, he, he, he uh, broke up. Sorry he about that. I, I was just trying to say like, it, it seems like uh, you have like, you've saved a lot of time on one route and that's gonna create like more capacity globally. Do you have some sense as to, can you measure that extra capacity that you have globally? Um, well, I, I'm not sure I agree with you. I, I'm not sure I would interpret these results in that way, right? So uh, 
I would rather say that it, it it's really it's not necessarily a time time saving thing, right? It's it's or like in the aggregate it might be, but but we only see we also looked at 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 the speed of 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 passing through the canal. And there's nothing there either, right? So it's no, no, only it's, the it's, size margin that matters. All, but all routes, you know, if if uh, the typical trip now takes 10 days, um, where it was taking 15 days, it's almost like you've increased worldwide shipping capacity by by a third, right? Um, and, and so so that's a, that's what I was trying to get at is is you know this route might not be speeding up, but the total number of routes globally are, are kind of going faster everywhere. Mm, mm. Um, kind of like what we saw with like uh, with COVID, right? The, the way we got more capacity was like putting stuff in airplanes and that kind of sped everything up and everyone got a mask real quickly. And, and, and that kind of generates extra, extra stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So can I go back to- I have sorry. a question? Oh. Sorry. Go ahead, Dory. Um, yeah, ladies first. Uh, I wanted to go back to something that uh, uh, Dan mentioned earlier about the endogenous network and also, you know, this relates to uh, 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 Jim's comment on the cost. I mean, I found that your picture um, really striking sort of the gains of this investment relative to the cost of making this investment and think about who captures those gains. So, you know, if, if you know, can Panama, to what extent can Panama capture um, gains from this investment that sufficiently sort of compensated for undertaking it? And do we think that there might be sort of underinvestment in infrastructure if the people who have to undertake the investment can't capture the gains? So, mm. I mean, without thinking about the pricing of the canal, that's kind of, you know, what what are they doing there? That that's not part of your model. I mean, your model doesn't have have an agent there who's deciding to invest in a node and then charge people to use the node. But sort of the picture that you showed, which again, I don't know whether you'd get the same picture if you allowed for this endogeneity. But it seems like you know a bunch of people are capturing the gains from this that are not Panama. But Panama is the guy who has to make the investment. Um, and you know, would we get? sort of a lot of underinvestment in infrastructure in an international sort of context, which, you know, domestically, we think we might be able to internalize this, but across countries, that's going to be just a lot harder. Mm. I think that's a great, like, general point. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what to do with it in, in this paper, but, but I agree with it. It's kind of, uh, I think it's an important uh, point. Well, it's more maybe you have the ability to quantify that. Again, modulo... Yeah. You don't have endogen the endogenous network formation in your model, but maybe that's okay. I don't know. You'd have to think about that. But mm -hmm. this sort of would be in terms of what is the question to which this paper is the answer. I think that would be quite compelling, just mm -hmm. to be able to say, look, um, these ports, you know, creating or these are particular routes where investment in infrastructure has big spillover effects that are not captured by the people who have to make the investment. Uh, what does that say for you know? Uh, a role for international cooperation or something. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's um, that's certainly very important. Um, I think it also uh, it reminds me to to go back to the comment on on the pricing too that uh, we should be a little bit more careful in terms of uh, understanding fully um, how how that part of this also changed with the uh, with the expanded canal. Hmm. Uh, Andreas, I have two questions that are somewhat related to, to the model, but also what I thought uh, Doreen was going to ask about uh, global, about global value chains or networks is the term that she used. Um, so in the model, is it just a bunch of people sitting around and wanting to ship to other places, but the amount they're going to ship is, is just fixed. It's just a route that's varying so that they, if you looked in the UN comp trade, for example, you wouldn't see, you know, if the model is totally correct, you wouldn't see any change in trade volume. It's not that firms are deciding to buy their goods somewhere else because now it's cheaper. Is it? Uh, um, does the model um, allow for that? For changes in trade volume? 
So um, that's, it's, it's just a very direct question on the model. And then I have another question on the model. So, so, so certainly, like both traffic flows and trade volumes are responding here, right? Yeah, responding. And I didn't have time to show you that, but in fact, if you with the with with the counterfactual I, I just showed you, um, so the, those gains were because in, of the trade volumes. Yeah, so the increase in trade that we get from the model is actually very close to if you do that regression on the simulated data that that, that reduced from regression, you also get like a ten percent. So the model gives you exactly the in increase in trade that we saw in, in the reduced form. So can you use a UN contract as an outside check on the model? Um, yes, so that, that's what we're doing, right? Oh, okay, I missed it. I didn't understand when you did that, sorry. Yeah, I, it was a little bit too, too fast in the end, but 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 I think it's, um, I think it's important to, to that that the model we, we parameterize the model with only the AIS data, right? That's the X size in, in, in the model. Yeah. But that gives us predictions on trade between countries or, or ports. And those predictions line up perfectly with the evidence from the reduced form. From the contrade, from yeah. the okay, valid. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry, I had I had not understood that and then the the other question is that uh, also in the model is surprised that all the trade costs go down in that there are going to be some large ships a little bit in the lines of what sam was asking there are going to be some line uh, large ships that were being used in some other routes and now they're going to be diverted to the panama canal um so how come no costs go up oh i think that, that included uh... my assumption yeah, uh, so as long as the the T, so the transportation costs are either not changing or going down, I think by the logic of this model, the, the tau, so the trade costs, uh, also has to be, be zero or declining. Yeah, but not if there's a fixed number of ships and all that's yeah. happening is you're redistributing ships. Definitely. Then I agree they would still... Yeah. Go down in general, but not on broad. I think exactly. Yeah. My my question is actually very related. I um and just you you have a functional form where you you were looking at this parameter delta um to capture the kind of economy scale, kind of how does the uh, the ship size translate into the reduction of the trade costs? I've I've been mm -hmm. just wondering, like you know. When you were doing your analysis, how that parameter that seems like to be a very key parameter. I've been wondering, like, um, maybe you skip the slides, you know, how, how that parameter were identified. Um, yeah, so, um, because the, presumably I was originally thinking you could use your DID to, uh, I, I think you can almost like that's a one on one mapping almost like, but but I, I don't know with since you are now seem to using the DID as an external validation exercise, then I missed the connection about how, how this delta parameter is uh, pinned down. Yeah, so I, I think the intuition is, is, is quite, it's quite simple, right? That we, the, um, the, um, the increase in ship size is, is increasing traffic volume on, on these segments. And, uh, and as long as you have, and, and the model gives us a prediction between the XI, the, so the traffic, um, and the transportation costs and along, along with these uh, multilateral resistance variables. And as long as you impose uh, a functional form relationship between the, uh, uh, the ship size um, and the excise, then you can naturally kind of back, up, back out uh, the delta, uh, as long as you have a, uh, an estimate or a guess of the elasticity of substitution. Not uh, very similar to what you know we've done with like gravity models for for many years. But but in some way you do observe the change because your DID is giving us the change of the ship size over time, right? So does that actually? Um, I've, I've been wondering whether you will be using that relationship to to actually tell us about that, or because otherwise you would have to use the whole cross section of like what ship size look like. At different pairs ex ante to, to actually back out. 
that yeah, so now it's, it's only the change in the ship size right yeah. from before to after from, the, from before uh, to after so yeah. so in some way i think uh, you are implicit origin already using the trade flow changes to to estimate that that's what you're saying right no i'm using traffic flows right traffic so remember flows. Remember, traffic flows are coming from AIS and not from, from Comtrade, right? Got, got it. Traffic flows, that identifies it. Okay, mm. okay, I see. All right, thanks. Can you show us, since I clearly missed it, can you show us again that the comparison between the prediction of the model and the UN Comtrade? Oh, um, yeah, so I didn't show you that slide even. Oh. <laughs> because I, it, but, but <laughs> I'm, I was I'm embarrassed by my question. <laughs> Uh, so, so this, yeah, this, so this is the slide. So here, uh, here I'm doing, I'm doing the reduced form exactly as, as I, I showed you early in the presentation, but I'm, I'm switching, I'm replacing my left-hand side variable with a change in trade according to the model, okay? So that's the X uh, hat hair simulated, right? And doing exactly the same regression at the port pair level, we get like an 8% 8 increase in trades, country pair level 9%. And I think what you saw in the beginning was nine, ten percent. So, so the model delivers very, very similar responses. Yeah. It also took me some time to. So, I'm I'm trying to consistently use the the terminology traffic for the container flows and trade for like trade. It took me some time to always be able to distinguish these two things. <laughs> Andreas, good. Um, can you come back to Doria and comments sort of intrigued me. Um, in some, at some level, there's two ways I think in which you can put some IO and industrial organization to this paper that might be super interesting. The first is Panama is a developer. So we know in models of increasing returns to scale, when you have a developer, you can get radically different outcomes. This is, I guess, Henderson, you know, Henderson made his career on this. So Panama is not the only player in this game. China tried to build uh, its own uh, canal in Nicaragua uh, mm. and failed. I don't know why, but imagine that you could compete, uh, developers could compete in, in, in building networks, because I think that is the core issue with the rethinking of supply chains about China. That China made a real effort to build all the infrastructure it needed to lock up supply chains, including all the investment in port facilities. Right, it, their port facility is, uh, capacity is vastly in excess of anything else in the rest of the planet. Um, so they 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 are China was a developer. They spent massive sums of money, probably hundred billion dollars, building port facilities. So that altered the competition. It altered where goods are shipped from and how. So Panama also did something on a much smaller scale when it expanded the canal. So. Thinking about competition for building this infrastructure, how does that affect uh, what equilibrium we're going to see would be one interesting thing. And then the second one is, to my mind, and then the second one is this, just this point by Gro Grossman and Rossi Hansberg, that uh, these old models of external returns to scale that we used to have, which assume perfect competition, and you know, think about you know, Krugman or Helpman's uh, or Ether's models, uh, if you replace the perfect competition with Bertrand competition, you get radically different results in which there is only a single unique equilibrium. So the, the nature of competition affects how many equilibria there are. I, I just wonder if, if somehow you could put in some, maybe some something that will make us flesh out these notions of what type of equilibria exist. Um, I, don't, I don't know how, this is maybe pie in the sky thinking on my part. I, but to me, this multiple equilibria is sort of interesting. And, and there's some strands in the IO-ish literature that, that might help us. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not entirely convinced that this uh, belongs to, to this paper. Buy <laughs> uh, in the sky. <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, I agree with you that these are extremely important uh, questions. Um, um, but it would be it, it would be like a big big change, right? Because now we're talking yeah. about 
Well, I think uh, the biggest change is you need fixed costs. And you know, Sam's model doesn't particularly like fixed costs. Yeah. Uh, fixed costs of building ports and, and yeah. you know, enhancing exactly. routes. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I'll think about it. Andreas, I have a much smaller and technical point. <laughs> Just recently, we all saw the paper with Felix and, and um, John Dingle mm -hmm. on um, had algebra when there's sparse or small numbers. And you seem with the port pairs to have very sparse, a very sparse matrix. So it seems like maybe perhaps estimating those trade costs instead of doing had algebra maybe the better econometric approach but <laughs> this is a it's a small point and i feel bad about keeping everybody else here um you can easily implement the other method and see if anything ch changes so, so you're saying questions. um is that you use had algebra to do your counterfactual right yeah. So you, with head you know, algebra, the zeros will mean that you have infinite cost for some trade pairs, for some port pairs. Yeah. Or maybe there's a finite cost for some port pair just because it happened once. And you can get weird results there because you're mixing what is structural error from um, small numbers. And so the preferred approach, according to them, and I bought their argument, is to just estimate the trade costs using some type of parametric form, standard type of old old fashioned called gravity, right? In any case, just something out there that uh, uh, there's a new paper on um, arguing about the risk of using hand algebra when you have small, lots of observations that may arise from oh, yeah. small numbers. Yeah, I see your point, yeah. Yeah, no, no. So, so certainly, um, you know, the, there are a lot of zeros in, in terms of the port, you know, port pair or the, yeah. the port yeah. network. Uh, so that might uh, that might matter. I haven't thought deeply about that, but um, yeah, thanks for the. This is super nice paper. Congratulations. Thanks. Take care. So, and Andreas. Um, so we had some discussion about time versus distance earlier. And, and I wonder if there's a way of kind of sorting out a little bit better um, the, the relative role of time versus distance, um, either by using like, uh, I mean, you have like really rich data and you can sort of figure out which, which, uh, which, which locations have kind of gotten uh, the distance has fallen the most and then which locations kind of the, the time between like shipping between them has fallen the most. And, Maybe there's a way of sorting out whether the Panama Canal was like a, a real benefit because it sped things up, or if it's just kind of like you're going shorter distance and you're burning less fuel getting there. Do you have mm -hmm. any sense as to a way in which you can kind of sort that out as to, so we can kind of figure out what, what's the kind of real constraint? I, I guess the, the fundamental problem, so, so why, do, why do we focus on time, and, you know, it's mostly for practical reasons, right? It's it's what we it's what we can measure. <laughs> so uh, and for the the cost margin, um, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how I would go about that. Um, uh, of course, we 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 could perhaps. Uh, introduce some additional data, for example, on, on freight rates, uh, something like that, that might, you know, together with this data might be able to, uh, to help us a little bit. But you something like that. Something where, um, you know, when the Panama Canal comes in, it's going to speed some, some, some routes up by more than other routes, right? Um, and it's going to allow you to maybe avoid kind of transfers of products. So I, I just wonder if there's a way of Doing something empirical where you kind of tell us how important time was versus distance in in uh in I, I don't have it figured out in my head quite yet, but it seems like something creative you could you could probably do, and, um, and then we could kind of have a sense at it. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure either, but I'm going to think about that. I, I think it's a good comment. I'm going to think about it too. But <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, call, go ahead. Call quick, Kevin, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll harass Andreas a little more. Yeah, so I was going to stop the recording.